Okay, uh, it is noon on Wednesday, and so that means it is Writing Wednesday, where I answer your writing questions, um, questions about how to live as a writer, think as a writer, um, deal with what comes up. So I am uh, open to questions. Uh, if you have any questions, just put them in the comments and I'll go ahead and an answer them. And if you have questions in the week, uh, please write to me through my website and uh, JanetFitchWrites.com and I'm happy to answer your questions. Uh, tonight I am going to be reading a, part of a roundtable reading of a uh, poetry anthology that I have uh, recent that's recently come out that I have four poems in and uh, I think we'll be reading throughout through the book um, so uh, if you're interested in that there's a link um, uh, ad hoc Inc a d h o c i n k at yahoo.com uh, and if you RSVP they'll send you a link six six o'clock Pacific time uh, tonight, Wednesday, uh, the whatever it is, 12th. Um, here's a question. Uh, do you have any writing software for writing the novel which you feel is better than Microsoft Word? Word is pretty standard. Um, I don't use a writing software. I um, just go with Word. Uh, I used to use WordPerfect, but it became harder and harder to find. Uh, yeah, and Peggy Dobrier says tonight, um, tonight, the, uh, the reading of Slow Lightning, uh, the poetry anthology. Um, and um, so the question is writing software. Uh, it, I, I find Word is the standard, so that's what I use. Um, I have been known to use Scrivener for first draft, but then I have to import it into Word. Uh, to send it around. Um, so, uh, I mean, Word is pretty standard. Um, as far as other writing softwares, I mean, people use different things, but I, I use, um, and I have an Apple, uh, but I always use WordPerfect. Um, so, let's see if we have any questions to begin with. Hi, Janine. Hi, Lewis. Um, the first question I had was, or the first thing I wanted to talk about was um, a teacher's question came to me today, um, or came to me, and I'd like to talk to it today. Um, a uh, teacher, writing teacher that I know, um, had a conflict in her workshop. Um, I mean, everybody um, is kind of touchy these days. Uh, people are trying to make progress in all kinds of social directions. And uh, there was a conflict that came up in a workshop uh, where a student was highly offended by another student's work. And um, the other student also became offended, and the teacher wrote to me saying, well, what do I do about um, conflict in the workshop rather than conflict on the page? You want conflict on the page, you don't want it so much in your workshop. <clears throat> and um, from what she was saying, it sounded like the person who found whatever the writing was found, uh, uh, took offense at what had been written. Uh, it sounded like probably that uh, that student uh, had some legitimate uh, basis of criticism uh, there. But the difficulty was a, a writer's workshop is not a book group. In a book group, you say, how you felt about the book. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Did you hate, you know, were you offended? Were you uh, enthralled? Blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> because a book group is how, how did I enjoy the, did I enjoy the book? And what did I enjoy about it? Didn't I enjoy that? Slightly different than a writer's group. 
a writer's workshop. And anybody who goes on and does a summer workshop or is in workshop now or is in doing an MFA program now, uh, you know, should just take this under your belt. I always talk about it when I start a workshop. The purpose of a workshop is not to express your feelings about the work in question. It's not to show your erudition to the other people in the workshop. It is not to vent your feelings about the work. Um, the purpose of a writer's workshop is to help the person whose work is under consideration. So isn't that the same thing? You know, that you say what you don't like, what you don't like, blah, blah, blah. Isn't, you know, you're offended, you're upset, you know. Isn't that the same thing as critique? No, because it has a different focus. When I'm talking about how upset I am about something I'm reading, I'm talking about myself and my feelings and me, me, me. It's about me. Whereas critique is about the story and about the other writer. And can you couch your objections to their work or what they've presented in a way that will help the story, in a way that will help the writer? And if you're upset, if you're you know, telling them how much you hate whatever they're doing um, and that you think they're an idiot and, you know, what if they never met, you know, a, a woman, if they never met a, you know, whatever that you see their problem as being, um, you are not being a good uh, workshop member. You are making it about you and your reaction, whereas you need to focus on getting through to the person, giving critique, probably legitimate, you know, but you have an extra step. You're upset. You have an extra step. It's saying you have to kind of click into your rational self and say, okay, I am upset about this. This person doesn't know what they're talking about. You know, this person, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we're still in my personality. We're still in my reaction. What you need to do then is take the next step and go, how can I phrase this in a way that this person can take it under advisement and think about it and, and address it in their work? So you have to couch things in a way the other person can hear hear you. Because if they think you're just an, an asshole, they're not going to listen to a thing you say. They're just going to get mad in return and, and, you know, close the door. So if you're just going to vent, you might as well not say anything at all, because it's not going to have the desired effect on the other writer. So you, as a good workshop member, you think, okay, this person clearly doesn't understand the character that they've chosen. Say this was this teacher's difficulty. Um, you think, okay, now how can I help this person? What is the one thing I can tell them that will help them move forward on their work? If you can't think of a way, just pass. Or maybe do it, you know, give them a written, you know, you know, your written comment. Um, but try your darndest to make it less personal, make it less about your feelings, and more take the next step and try to analyze how would you help somebody who has this problem. Maybe they're using a stereotype and have not thoroughly investigated the individual situ the individual situation or character, you know, um, that uh, say 
you know, in your experience, uh, um, this is a stereotype of character, you know, of Abigail. This is a stereotype of, say, a valet girl. Let's just take a, like a fairly non-problematic person. This is a stereotype of a valet girl. You know, every, there is no such thing as a generic person. And you feel that this character is underexplored. Um, generally, I, if people have underexplored characters, I recommend um, not reading uh, art about those characters, but actual exploration into who people are as real people. Um, interviews, documentaries, um, try to, you know, the, the comment might be, you know, I feel that this character is, um, is under observed. Um, I've seen this type of description of a character like this many, many times. This is a cliche and under investigated. And I, would recommend the character, uh, this character be uh, more, there should be more research involved. That's a very neutral way of saying the same thing. <laughs> you know, you could warn them and say, you know, I find especially this kind of characterization will give you problems, that there will be people who are offended by such a description, like me. But you don't have to say like you, you know, you can say, you can say it in a, but it's very important to say it in a way that will help the other person. So I, I in, you know, when I teach a workshop, this is always the, f the first day lecture is, you know, your purpose in being in the workshop is to help other writers, not to show off or to make it about you and your feelings. Um, and we're all full of feelings. That's why we're writers. <laughs> so it, it requires a little bit of patience on the teacher's part, on the uh, participant's part, to learn how to feel your feelings about the work and then think about how can I express what I need to say about this work in a way that will help that other person. And keep that foremost in your mind. Will this help? It's not going to help. If you just don't like their work. I mean, everybody's been in workshop with those people. They just don't like your work. And everything they say is just like, why are you even talking? You hate my stuff. And people should learn, you know. Uh, you know, I don't like sports. You know, I don't like sports. You've written a story about sports. I don't like your story. Maybe you should make it about ballet. You know, it's like, why don't you just shut up? <laughs> you don't have to share because <laughs> that's not going to help the person. Or you see that they've written about sports, and but they've failed to characterize something. You know, think about where you can offer a useful insight. Um and if there's something that offends you, um, often it's just something that you wouldn't do that way. Um, if it was you, you wouldn't do it that way. But that's not critique, because it's not your story, it's their story. So it's teaching that person, you know, that, that uh, you know, this doesn't ring true to my experience. And I think it would be helpful for you to blah, 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 or consider that somebody, you know, that this is a, you know, find a more, uh, a less stereotype reaction. So anyway, to, to always think about how you can help. Uh, so workshop isn't about you and your work until it is and then you have to shut up and listen to what other people say so it's the workshop you know has a buy-in and the buy-in is that it needs to be helpful 
um, Janine says, as a former reader for film and TV, we were at we were trained to ask questions and not give personal opinions on the work. Yeah, because uh, a work has to ha it has a, its interior sense, and our job as workshop members is to strengthen its interior sense, even if it's not your thing. Um, the next thing I have is. Um, Wendy, I don't know if Wendy's here, uh, but she says this question came up in her workshop, uh, which is in terms of novel revisions, how do you know when you're finished and it's time to send it out? Do you have a personal checklist or do you go by your own temperament or do you just know? Um, Everybody who has been in a workshop has seen someone working on some, something past its time. And you often see those people stripping out things that were good in a, an earlier draft because they're looking to change it. They, they know it's not quite done and they, they're listening to too many voices they're not retaining, they're not asking themselves what's the most important thing about this work. And the most important thing is about the dramatics, the emotional movement from chapter to chapter, scene to scene, what happens, who is the protagonist, are we staying close to their internal life, are we using the senses? So I do have sort of a checklist of things that when something has reached a last draft or what I feel might be a last draft, I do go through a list of things, you know. Have I kept the senses in there? Are there smells, sounds, colors, blah, 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 on every page? Is it alive? Is it embodied? Is it, you know, because this is the kind of prose I write. Uh, I want a novel that is rich with sensual details so that the reader can be in inside the work. Um, so I have a check. So I, I'll go over and make sure that there is that we're fully embodied. The senses are completely in play. I check. Do I have the landscape? Do I know? Does the reader know where they are? at all times? Do they know what the weather is? Do they know what's going on outside the window? Do they know what the light is? Uh, do they know um, what the character is doing with their hands? What they're, what the, what's going on in the room? What's going on outside of the room? You know, I'm really big on building that world uh, so that it's very solid. So that's one of the things I do towards the end. I also read through it um, allowed to hear the music and I'm changing words, uh, phrases and words. I'm compressing some things because when you read them out loud, you often find a better way to phrase something that it, it becomes more condensed, uh, more beautiful, more rhythmic, more, you know, you find a better image. And this is finishing touches stuff. What you have to be careful of is changing for the different. If you find you make a change and it's no better than it was before, go back to the way it was before. So um, be very careful to keep track of um, drafts. So be very careful to note this one, your last draft. Uh, and don't get lost in a welter of different versions of the same thing. It, you know, you're, you will be overwhelmed. Um, so I uh, tend to, if I change something that day, I will go, I go, this is no better than it was before and delete it and go back to it. So I don't have three or four, 10 or 50 versions of this thing floating around. Be really careful about your kind of, your uh, um, writer's bookkeeping. 
Um, and then notice in in you, if you're in a workshop, you can help other people uh, in your own self. Notice if you're carving out stuff that was people really liked and that was good. Uh, it, it's a kind of a disastrous thing that happens as you get closer to the end is that sometimes the you forget how much work you put into every part of that book. And you begin to carve shit out like it's a Easter roast. Um, be very careful of that. Um, I have been in workshops with people who had a nice big fat book and just decided it needed to be lean and mean and carved out everything that was alive, all the flesh. So they had a nice set of of bones but what's what's you know a nice set of bones is not a living creature it's it's a you know they carved it down to the bones and it's not um uh, you know if you have gordon lish working with you and you're raymond carver you know uh you know go for it i guess but even carver regretted some of the cutting that he had done I'd be very careful about that. Uh, I think I've seen it happen too much. Uh, people have a rich book and then they carve out everything that's interesting about it. <laughs> you know, just because it's a nice skeleton doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's as rich and moving as what came before, which could have been slightly more ungainly, but had a lot of, good stuff in it. Um, so I be very careful of what you're doing at the end. You know, first draft, you're cutting, you're moving stuff around. That's one thing because you can, you can play with it. But if you have, if it's rich and colorful and you're, you start taking that, that, you know, kill your darlings thing, I, I couldn't disagree with that more uh, because I've seen too many people kill their, lively, colorful, rich, messy books, uh, cut them down to like gray little skeletons. And uh, it's a, don't do that. <laughs> so why would they do that typically, Lisa asks. Um, everybody's insecure. You know, everybody's heard things like kill your darlings or, you know, this, it's, you know, the structure, where's this, what's the structure? Uh, they ask themselves questions that are better left to screenwriters, better left to, you know, short story writers, screenwriters. Novels, the most important thing is not the bone structure. The most important thing is the living organism and what is interesting about it. In poetry, you have lines, like the, you remember the great lines. Uh, in, 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 um, in fiction, especially in a novel, you know, you're going to remember the vivid characters, you remember the vivid scenes, you're going to remember fe the feeling, the bulk, the, the interactions, you know, the intensity. Um, you're not going to get that if you've cut it to the bone. Um, and people who are cutters were, are going to go, you know, that you're crazy, like you need to do this. But um, I've seen too many people like cut their books up way too much. Um, I think they don't trust themselves. Why would they do this typically? I think they don't trust themselves. They don't trust the work. Um, they get sick of it. You know, they've been working on it for seven, eight years and they just can't see it anymore. And they, you know, they can just, because they can't feel it anymore, they can go, they go ahead and slash it. Um, rather than remembering how much they put into everything. Um, and I've seen people, there these things, try to get them out, you know? It's like, I've seen people linger with their work and change it and change it and change it and change it and change it. Um, 
and uh, it's like it's overcook overcooking it. You know, I'd rather see a few little raw bits in it than have it so overcooked that the taste is all eaten out of it. Um, but I do go for the music. I do go for, you know, really caring about the senses and the uh, polishing the language uh, to make sure it's beautiful. Um, time to send it out. I do um, make sure that it's readable, you know, you can read right through it, find a clean reader and have them read through it. Um, if they stumble and it's like, what happened to Jake here? You know, where's Jake? And it's like, oh yeah, Jake, I lost Jake somewhere in the third, dra <laughs> third draft. Um, you don't get, you know, uh, once you send it out, um, you know, it better be the book that you want to see in print. Um, and then that, uh, that leads you to the, um, um, when you find yourself making changes and then changing it back, that's time to stop working on it and, and send it out or at least send it to the clean reader. Um, but watch the slash, the tendency to want to slash and burn. So Louis says, what factors should be considered in determining how much to say about a character's appearance? Um, it shouldn't be static. You know, the character's appearance is in passing while they're doing something else. You know, his pace as he, you know, you know, half runs, half limps down the street. Uh, you don't, you don't see somebody like in a diorama where the, or, you know, where the action stops and you, you describe them in a big chunk. You know, you describe a character in passing. You describe the way the light falls on that character and what it means and move on. Um, so factors are, if it's static, then that's not good. That it, it, something needs to be active in the description. And don't do it all at once. You know, unpack it little by little. Every time you see them, you're going to see something else about them. Uh, so you don't, it's not you describe them once and you're done. You know, you're always describing them. Um, and then uh, Grant says, I'm wondering if editors and publishers write drive most writers to go to the edge of the cliff thinking they have to cut, cut, cut. No. No, they don't. Um, most editors, I mean, if they've bought it, the most, the thing that they will do is help you cut the things that are getting in the way of the story, maybe. Uh, tighten things up. Maybe they see, you know, a chunk that doesn't need to be in there at all. Um, so, you know, once they've bought it, they believe in that book. And you can listen to what they say. And if it really sounds wrong to you, you don't have to do what they tell you to do. Do most of it. But if there's a cut that you just don't see, don't fight about it. Just don't do it. <laughs> um So the other uh, question I have is, is um, the rejection question um, that we're all going to see in, sometime in our lives, ourselves or others, where a project that you really think is, uh, is fantastic will be rejected. Um, and this is something that happens to you before you're published a lot. You expect it. When you haven't been published, you expect the rejection. You expect people to say, you know, does not meet our needs at this time. You know, you expect to be looking for agents by the, you know, by the tier. 
and finding somebody. It's very different if you're a published book uh, author and then there's a book that your agent perhaps uh, or your publisher um, uh, decides is not for them. And what do you do? Do you rewrite it? Do you just say, well, it is the book I wanted it to be and send it to the next person. Um, the first thing in all rejection, the first thing is mental health, is your own, your own mood, your own well-being. Um, always, if you're the kind of person who beats themselves up, you know, really be good to yourself. You know, be the mother you never had or the father you never had or the, you know, the mentor you never had to yourself. And just like, you know, not everybody likes everything. Not everybody likes chocolate. There's times that even your own agent will look at something that you've written and just go, nope, I'm too far out. No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. If they don't say any why, it might be valuable to find out what the problem is. Um, and then it's saying, um, I, I would definitely deal with the emotional crisis first. Deal with the emotional crisis. You know, maybe you don't wanna see your writer's group for a while. <laughs> If you've gotten something like that and, you know, maybe you want to spend some time with friends who aren't writers and remind yourself that it's a big world and there are people who, who aren't writers and who love you anyway, no matter what. Um, and then let it cool down a little bit before you take a look at it. So, you know, let yourself cool down a little bit. And then you'll look at this thing, which you might not want to look at immediately, but you know, you'll know that eventually you have to because you've, and then you, you know, you read it, you get somebody, a clean reader to read it, somebody who hasn't seen it before. Um, and to tell you honestly what, what they think might be the problem with it. Um, often you have a book where you just, once you know what the problem with it is, you might not want to rewrite it. It might be just a, a problem inherent in the book that you chose to write, and there's just nothing you can do about it. Um, you might, one bit of advice is that if you read it and find that you can see what your problem was, Maybe you cut it to the bone and there's all this other material that um, could be knit back in there. Um, I would say try to write that from memory rather than going back into the, you know, into the archives and trying to find uh, pieces, especially if you have a lot of stuff you've cut out or a lot of versions of of the book, um, it's better to write it clean from there, um, insert what needs to be inserted from what you can remember. Um, and uh, just know that this is part of the writer's life too. It's not all gonna be champagne and uh, peacocks, you know? <laughs> There's gonna be shocking rejections as well. Um, and uh, it's understanding not everybody's going to like everything you do. Even your agent isn't necessarily going to like everything you do. You have to decide, is this the book that you want to publish the way you want to publish it? Do you feel that there are problems with the book aside from those rejections? Um, or that, usually it's like a one big shocking rejection of some, somebody you thought was going to really like it. Um, you know, ask yourself, is it not their cup of tea? 
you know, I wrote a, you know, a noir and they were expecting a, you know, relationship novel and they really are reacting. Sometimes people have expectations of you that your that your book didn't fulfill, that you went in another direction. And when a when an agent say or publisher says, you know, this is not the you know, this is not the Sam Smith book that we want to publish. Then think about who would actually like the book that you wrote. Um, if your agent says, I just, this is not the you that I want to be selling, um, you might look at another agent or you might look at a smaller house that uh, doesn't require an agent to, doesn't require the book to be agented. And say, you know, I wrote this crazy book. My agent isn't interested in it, um, you know, but I, I still love it. And, you know, would you take a look at it? Um, so this kind of thing doesn't stop once you become a published author. You know, you think that first book, you know, once I, once I, I sell my first book, you know, it's like, I got it made. Now it's, it's all, you know, now it's all going to be, um, uh, you know, hay rides. And then you'll, you know, you might, lose a book you might have a book that just doesn't come together and you write it and you try this and you try this and it just doesn't come together that happens you know you get used to the fact that often you have to move on and that kind of the resiliency is like such a it's like forgiveness it's such a uh, uh, oft used, oft bandied about word. Um, but it's like learning how to scrape yourself off the bathroom floor where you've been crying for three days, how to scrape yourself off of the bathroom floor and write something else. Put, you know, you might want to put that aside for a little while. Maybe you can't deal with it right now. Write a short story, write, do some exercises, you know, think about what, what you can do in the meantime. You might, you know, I've seen people start another, just start another novel, say, oh, my agent doesn't like that, doesn't like it, doesn't want to handle it. I, or my publisher, I see problems now with it that I didn't see before. And I'm not, you know, I don't. Not, I don't want to rewrite it. You know, it is what it is. Um, so you can find, try to find a home, another home for it. You can try to, if you are, think your agent just isn't getting where your direction is going, say, you know, that talk about that noir novel and say, you know, they see, see you as a certain kind of, uh, you know, you're, you write kind of uh, 18th century romances or, you know, uh, historicals, and here you've written this cr hard-boiled crime novel, and your agent is just like, I don't see it. Mm -mm. Then you think, am I becoming, do I want to move in the direction and become that noir writer? Or is this an ab just a one-off that I th just had fun writing? You might want to find a smaller publisher for it if you think it's it's a solid piece of writing still if you think it's a shaky piece of writing um then let it cool read it use a clean reader if you have one um and uh think about what it might what had been there that you took out that's often something. Uh, and don't try to find it, like just recreate it. Um, and then sometimes things have been overcooked. You know, it, you can go back and find an early version of it where it was still quite lively, although problematic in some way, or you can just move on. I know I can't solve this problem for you, but it's a heartbreaker. Um, and uh, every, not 
you know, many people are going to experience it. You know, um, don't think you won't. Don't think your agent is your, you know, fairy godmother, you know, or your publisher is your best buddy. You know, these are relationships that often have a time and a place and uh, people don't always stay with them. You know, it's it's actually kind of rare. Um, so don't think you're over just because your agent or your publisher turns the book away. Um, it's just it's that situation. So here is a question. Um, if someone has this dilemma, re rejection of the book by agent, etc., what about self-publishing? Does it kill the future for the writer to be considered a serious writer? Um, the self-publishing route, if you are in the kind of a mid-career writer, um, I think should only be considered if the piece is very strange. I think that you can find, if you're a mid-career writer who wrote a good book that just doesn't fit in with what the publisher and agent see in that writer, um, and the writer themselves doesn't feel like that's the direction they're going. If they feel that's the new direction they're going, they should be looking for another agent. Um, if they feel it's a one-off, you know, that this is not what I really want to do, but this was really fun, you know, writing a noir novel or sci-fi or romance or something like that, you know, you can find you know, I think your best bet is to find a smaller publisher for it. Um, so, rejection always sucks. It always sucks. And we need a good bag of tricks of how to um, keep our hearts. And, and starting something small that you can finish and get your byline on and get published will make you feel a lot better um, while you're deciding what to do with your larger project. Um, I mean, everybody has a failed novel in their drawer, at least one, <laughs> at least one. Sometimes they just don't come together. Um, so that's the danger of reworking and reworking and reworking a book for years and years and years. I mean, it's one thing to take a book that just takes a long time to get to the end, uh, you know, historical. Um, I was terrified, you know, I was losing the Russian book because it took so long. Um, I kind of panicked. And it's like I, there was no way I was going to abandon that book because it was still unfolding. Um, but if you have a book and then you go, you go, eh, I don't know, I think I should cut the hell out of it. You know, think twice about that one. Uh, or if you're in a workshop with somebody who decides, somebody in the workshop is like, oh, lean and mean is the way to go. You could cut this. You know, if you are in that workshop and you see that happening to someone, I would urge you to try to speak up and go, you know, maybe it just wants to be a big fat book and leave you know, the cutting, all that, you know, surgery, um, once it sells. <laughs> Let's see if there's anything else. Um, yeah, ask me anything. It's, uh, it's writer's life here. Um, Just imagine what we had in Machiavelli in, the, in a workshop uh, as a co-writer, the first draft of The Prince, oh, people who um, are uh, upset in the workshop and thinking of how to help that person. Um, if somebody reading, say, as, you know, a, a book potentially offensive as The Prince, um, a work, it's up to the workshop members to see what that person is trying to do and help them do it, not to opine. Um, you know, I think people should be kinder and less 
uh, conniving, that would not have helped Machiavelli. And if he's in your workshop, you, your job is to help him, not to um, to say, uh, you know, I don't think that what you're doing is very uh, kind, progressive. Uh, your portrayal of politics is really offensive to me. Just pass. <laughs> okay, scene writing approaches, how you go about developing scenes in your novel writing. Uh, I have a whole um, bunch of writing Wednesdays about scene, scene and story. Just make sure something happens that the character can't reset. That will help. So Janine says, I have problems getting to the ending too soon. How do we extend, i.e. get through the second act middle without rushing to the end? Okay, there are no acts in fiction. So you don't have to worry about first act, second act, third act, fourth act, you know, fifth act. Um, there are no acts, but there are scenes. And when you feel like you don't have anything more to say, perhaps it's not a novel, perhaps it's a short story or a novella. A novella has no, um, it has no secondary stories. You know, when you are writing a novel, you can have a potential lover, you can have, you know, secondary antagonist, you can have a crappy boss, you can have financial problems while you're trying to slay the dragon or whatever. Um, and you can go off into the side rooms and side corridors and um, back alleys of your novel. Um, if you can't, if you have none of those side issues, you might not have a novel, you might have a, a, a novella. Um, If it ends, if it's, if you don't have anything more to say, I mean, this is when I started writing, I had these three page short, short stories. Um, and I just couldn't figure out how to get more than three pages. I, I said what happened, you know, what more is there? And you'll find that in the, if you crack the sentence open, there's more often down in the, inside the sentence. So take your sentence, like I went to the store, and start interrogating it, start asking questions. You know, how did you go to the store? What store did you go to? You know, were you hungry and tired and in a rush? Hungry and tired and in a rush, I, and then you, went to the store starts looking bad because it's like getting new curtains. Everything else looks bad. It's like once you start improving any part of the sentence, the rest of the sentence looks bad. So went, I went to the store. Um, you can, that's one of the terrible 20, you know, let's improve the verb. Um, hungry, tired, and in a rush, I, um, I stopped in at the 7-Eleven, uh, picking, you know, picking up a rancid burrito and a box of Ho-Ho's and I would eat them on the way to work. Um, suddenly you have a character, you have action, you have thinking, you have spin. So stop and consider what you've already written and uh, open it up and interrogate it. Ask, get more specific, you know, uh, it was cold. Well, how cold was it? You know, how high was it? How cold was it? How greasy was it? Um, and get more and more specific. And as you break that open, things are down there inside the sentence that will, that open up the work. And then you'll end up not with three, a three page short, short, short story like I had. And st I'd started having decent length stories because I was asking questions of what I'd already written. So uh, I uh, wish you well and uh, uh, good writing and hope to see you tonight 
for Slow Lightning Anthology, and I will put the uh, link, uh, the email, so you can get the link, so you can come and hear us uh, listen to our things. So Malika says, um, do you have a Writing Wednesday on sentences that goes into clauses and the three parts of the sentence? Uh, one of the people who took my art of the sentence. Uh, yeah, I'm sure I do. Take a look. Um, okay, well, have a good one and uh, stay safe, stay uh, masked, <laughs> vax up, and uh, we'll see you here next week. Okay, bye.